Winfield, Knight, Santana, Tuffle, Hernandez, Carter behind the plate, and Ron Darling on the mound. Ron Darling, a 15 game winner during the year, is 1 and 1 in the World Series. He was 1 and 0 oh in the playoffs. And as you might remember in the series, he has not allowed an earned run to Boston in 14 consecutive innings. Wade Bond, Marty Barrett, and Bill Buckner, and here we go. Ball one. John Kibler, Jim Evans, Harry Wendelstedt, Joe Brinkman working the lines with Ed Montague and Dale Ford on the foul line. Right. One and one. Boggs backing out as an airplane flies overhead. We should have a lot of that tonight. The pattern evidently for the first time will bring planes almost constantly directly over Shea. One and one. Ball two. There is no breeze to speak of. The flag hanging limply in center field. Remember that's how Hernandez uh, he figures that the breeze when they're overhead blows to left field. Now back two and two. Go on a somewhat breathless night in New York. It's the final game of the year. Two and two to buy. Trick pitches. It's a fastball, a curve. He does have that split finger fastball, but he does not throw it hard. He kind of uses it as an off speed pitch. So three and two, the count to Wade by. Line drive at Santana. So Wade Boggs hits it right on the button, but right at Santana. One down. And second baseman Marty Barrett coming up. Barrett is hit in all six with four RBIs. On deck, Bill Buckner. Ball one. Walter Reniak coaching at first, Renee Latchman around at third for Boston. In there. One of the things that has bothered the Red Sox considerably throughout the series, leaving men on base. It's interesting, they have left 63 men on. If they leave nine more tonight, they will have tied a World Series record of 72 established by the Mets back in 1973. What might be a factor too is Mookie Wilson in center field then plays very shallow as compared to Dykstra. One and one. In there. They're yelling Marty. So the chance begin early tonight. The last game of the year and they're determined to be heard. That's hit in the air to shallow right field, but Strawberry is there. <laughs> Two down in the first inning, and here is Bill Buckner. He is getting, in some areas, a standing ovation, but you can understand the reasoning behind it. Two down, bases empty, first inning, no score. On deck, Jim Rice. Strike, outside corner. Now the chant is Billy, Billy. Breaking ball, ground foul, and the count 0 and 2. 
just on the strength of what we've seen, uh, it seems like Carter and Darling have picked the fastball, the one that tails away as the best pitch so far. He's really spotted it. That's the first breaking ball he's thrown. On to the Buckner. Join us late. Wade Boggs lined out to short. Marty Barrett flied to right as Bruce Hurst and Don Baylor look on. Fastball sliced down the left field line, and that one is going to land foul. Buckner halfway to second base. We'll have a long walk back. The infield was covered but watching Buckner around first base he kind of slipped He's, you can see he's got those high toppers on but uh, the infield was covered and it appears to be in pretty good shape but as he rounds it he does a little bit of a slip here right there. The so Buckner comes back one ball and two strikes to count two out first inning no score rice on deck the final baseball game of the year. hit for Buckner. So a two out single to right by Bill Buckner will bring up Jim Rice. Seem to reach for it and just plugs the gap between first and second. Interesting too looking at that Buckner as he was swinging Hernandez started to go the other way. I think Keith was expecting the ball to be pulled between him and the bag as opposed to in the hole. And here is Rice. Out in front of it, he was guessing fastball and the count on one. In the dirt, knocked down by Carter, and of course Buckner's not about to gamble on the base path. And Carter did a good job of shifting. He's ready to move. Just the tip of the glove got it, and as long as you keep that ball in front of you, no one is going to move, especially Buckner. So Buckner at first held on by Hernandez. Two out in the first inning, no score. One and one. The count to Jim Rice with Dwight Evans on deck. Fouled away off first base out of play. Came inside, hit him on the thumbs. Rice is using that choked up grip that he's gone to just a bit. And when you ask him about it, there you see it. He says, I just want to drive the ball. I want to hit it hard. I'm quicker with the bat when I choke up a little bit. One and two. Ron Darling pitching on four days rest because of rain and Bruce Hurst because of the rain starting over Dennis Oil Can Boyd. Got that left hand wrapped keeping it warm. One ball two strikes to Jim Rice. And that's line to right strawberry going to his left backhand. No runs, one hit, a man left at the end of half an inning. Sox nothing, Mets come sit down. So the Mets line up with Wilson, Tuffle, and Hernandez, Carter, Strawberry, and Knight, Mitchell, Santana, and Darling. And Bruce.
Hirsch, a 13 game winner during the year, 3 0 in postseason games, a brilliant earned run average of 1.7. And a ground ball to the right side to Marty Barrett, one pitch, one away. Take a look at the defense for the Red Sox. Rice, Henderson, and Evans in the outfield. It's the same as it's been. Boggs, Owen, Barrett, Buckner, Gedman behind the plate, and Bruce Hurst with that good curveball, that big overhand curveball. He changes speeds on it, a fork ball and a fastball, and he has been using them all. Hurst has had trouble with the hitter coming up, Tim Tuppel. Tuppel is four for seven against hers, including two singles, a double, and a home run. You might remember the home run went to right field in Fenway Park. Tim, whose error contributed heavily to the winning run scoring in game one. Four one. Following Tuppel, Keith Hernandez. One and oh. Strike. When he spots that pitch on that outside corner, he is just doubly tough because it just makes his other two pitches, the slow curveball and the fork ball, more effective. Fouled at the plate and the count one and two. I guess it figured we'd have a game like Saturday night when you realize that the Red Sox won 19 games in their last at bats, including the playoff. The Mets had 39 come from behind, then they had three in the playoff with Houston, and then Saturday night. Uh, this should go to the wire. One and two. Two and two. And you could just as well change the name of the bottom of that sheet to Sox in Boston. Popped in the air on the right side, and it's Marty Barrett. As a ball club, if you're the Red Sox, you're looking for a strong inning from your pitcher, much like Darling gave the Mets, and so far that's what Hurst has done. And with two out, here is Keith Hernandez. Another interesting aspect to the game tonight it is conceivable that the long men the so called long man in the bullpen tonight would be Dwight Gooden for the Mets and Dennis oil can Boyd for the Red Sox and Roger Clemens said before the game just talking to him he showed me where he had the blister he said I can go if they need me Gooden looking on with Santana and Howard Johnson in the dugout ball one to Keith Hernandez. Hernandez, a member of the 82 Cardinal Club that was down three games to two and won it. And he's trying to repeat it. You can see him shaking his head as another plane flies overhead. They really sound like they're low. I can see where your concentration would be broken. One ball and no strikes. Breaking ball strike and the count one and one. Bruce Hurst, if you throw out the last start he made, that was the game after the Red Sox had clinched, you get an indication of how well he's been pitching. That's line to center. Henderson will flag it, and the inning is over. Hurst has made 11 consecutive quality starts. And at the end of an inning, no score. Failed to play. And, of course, he's been looking ahead, trying to figure it out ever since Saturday morning. Talking to Tony Armas. Just watching it looked like he was talking about going the other way, an inside out swing, and Armas seemed to be talking about the defense, and that's we're using against Rice. Remember, in the first inning, the Sox hit the ball pretty hard. Boggs went the other way and lined to Santana. Rice went the other way and lined to Strawberry. Buckner pulled for a base hit to right. Barrett flied to right. Here's Dwight Evans, Rich Gedman, and then Dave Henderson. Second inning, no score. Breaking ball up, ball one. Top of the second. Fouled off. 
One ball, one strike. Two and the count one and two to Dwight Evans. Evans was saying that Saturday night's game ranked right up there with game six of the World Series. Now that really puts it in his spot. In 1975. In fact, Dwight was on deck when Carlton Fisk hit the home run, as he remembers. One and two. Sinker missed. It's pretty apparent very early that Darling is going to go with that sinker, that good hard fastball that he's throwing, because a couple times that Gary's put down the breaking ball, he is just shakes it off. Two balls and two strikes to Dwight Evans. Fouled at the plate. That's the way it looks at the hitter, and there's the rotation. Dwight well, just did get a piece of it, and the count stays two and two. Fastball missed. So he goes all the way. Foul off first, slicing down the line. Hernandez on the tarp roller to get a look, and it's way back. The great delight in this game, Vin. It's the seventh game of the World Series, so much riding on it. Yet, as you look with our center field shot, you'll still see that the same signs used on the playground. One was the fastball, two's the curve, and three's the split finger. Three and two to Dwight. Deep left center field. That one might go all the way. It is gone. Home run, Dwight Evans. It was a fastball, and Evans really jumped on it. He was a little bit out on fr in front on that ball he fouled off, but this one with the swing, he timed it perfectly and drove it a long way. Dwight Evans, second home run of the series, and his seventh run batted in, and it's the Red Sox who score first and lead one to nothing. The batter will be the left-hand hitting catcher, Rich Gedman, after we take one more look. And, of course, Evans, a great low ball hitter, and he got that ball down around the knees. Ball one to Gedman. Away, one ball, one strike. So Dwight Evans with a big home run to the back row of the bleachers in left center. Gedman fouls it away and the count one and two. They've been making Gedman chase the bad ball, changing speeds on him. It'll be interesting to see what uh, Carter and Darling do with this pitch. It's one ball and uh, two strikes. He's got that split finger. Maybe try to bounce one up and see what happens. Gedman followed by Dave Henderson. And as you can see, things come tumbling down. Well, they're portable stands, and obviously when the foul ball gets there, everybody leans, and there it goes. Fortunately, it doesn't appear anybody got hurt. Time out for a moment while they restore that. So we can tell you that that home run by Dwight Evans is the ninth home run in this World Series. What makes it interesting, all in the road ballpark. The Red Sox have now hit four home runs in the series, and the Mets have hit five. So as Tom Seaver sits quietly eating sunflower seeds, they prepare the wall in right field and time is out. One nothing Red Sox, top of the second inning. Talk about sunflower seeds, I thought it was kind of interesting. Only in the World Series coverage do you get it where they had psychologists 
try to figure out why ball players chew tobacco, chew gum, chew sunflower seeds. I can't understand why they chew tobacco. I wish they'd stop that. But the sunflower seeds, they had all kinds of reasons for that. But only in the World Series did they emphasize something like that. Meanwhile, the walls come tumbling down, so time out at Shea. You might wonder about that rain out that we had. Going back to the history books in 1911, if you can imagine, between games three and four of the World Series, there was a six day rain delay. The 1911 World Series finished on October the 26th. Then, of course, in 1962, you might remember, in San Francisco, game six was rained out three times. And 1975, game six was rained out three times. And in going back through the history books, yet another footnote to Saturday night's game. Game six of the 1986 World Series will be listed as the greatest comeback game in World Series history. No team down by two runs scored three in its last at bat until Saturday night. Dwight Evans. You remember against Jack Mars opening day in Detroit. This is the way his season began. What a way to start. You hit the first pitch of the season out for a home run. And now Dwight opening up the second inning for the Red Sox hits another home run and Boston leads one nothing. And he's accustomed to hitting them in another park. OK, the wall has been secured, and here is Gedman with a count of one ball and two strikes. And that's a drive into right center field. Strawberry going back to the wall. At the wall, leaps in the air. One hands it. No, he missed it. The right hand of Dale Ford started up and then circled to indicate home run. And Strawberry coming with an inch, it's gone, and the Sox lead two to nothing. We've seen a number of these plays. He gets a glove on it. His glove is over the fence. It looks like he's going to rob Gedman as he finds the fence of the home run. He gets above it. It hits the glove, and then his arm appears to hit the fence. Over it goes. He was looking for it and realizes he doesn't have it. We saw Henderson do that in the playoffs. We saw Dwight Evans do it, and now here's Strawberry. So it is two to nothing Boston on back to back home run by Dwight Evans and Rich Gedman. The batter is Dave Henderson who takes ball one. For Ron Darling his string of consecutive scoreless innings ends shockingly after 15. Strawberry really thought he had that but so did he I. grabbed nothing. Now back two and one to count. This was the non catch of Dwight Evans in Boston. Got his glove on it, arm hits the wall, and out it goes. So we've seen that three times Henderson, Evans, and now Strawberry. Two and one. Three and one. So the Red Sox hit the ball hard in the first inning and they hit two out in the second inning and there's ball four to Henderson. Darling has now walked ten men in the series and Mel Stottlemyre going out to talk to him to see if he can find the solution. Spike Owen will be the batter. Nobody out. Pretty apparent why Stottlemyre is going out there just to settle him down because back to back home runs and. Hey, that'll get you to thinking. It'll get you to aiming, and all Stoudemire wants to do is, hey, look, okay, so they got the two runs. Let's get let's get settled down here and and go back to work. You can see by the reaction on Gedman's home run that uh, it was a bit of a shocker as far as Darling was concerned. Strawberry looked like he was going to make the play. He gets there. He knows exactly where the fence is. He gets above it. Off his glove, and then he looks in his glove. He thought he had it. Oh, he says, but it's a home run. Oh. 
Ron Darling gave up 21 home runs during the regular year, so he stung back to back. And now with Henderson on and nobody out, Spike Owen is the batter. Knight cheating in at third base. And with Owen, they can certainly put a play on because he can handle that bat. And for the historian, the last time, 1981, Guerrero and Yeager of Ron Guidry, Dodgers versus Yankees. Strike. Spike having a good series as a quick look down at Rene Latchman. Henderson held on by Keith Hernandez. Two nothing Red Sox top of the second inning. Darling has a good quick move when he throws the first base with his good move it is quick he can pick you off. Balls one strike. That's in there. The scouts rate Darling as being quick to first, but pretty slow coming to the plate. Darling is considered a good fielder. 0 oh 2 the count. Henderson with a walk at first. Anyone wondered with the fog here tonight and no wind whether the ball will carry? That question has been answered by Evans and Gedman. And that's a little pop fly to Santana. One out in the top of the second inning, two to nothing Boston, and Bruce Hurst coming out. First you remember and he was very good natured about it in taking his at bats here against Darling struck out three times. In fact the last time he came up in that game there were a couple of runners aboard and he said Gary Carter and the plate umpire were laughing and Hurst said hey be serious up here. They laughed some more as he struck out a third time. But the Mets now are not looking laughs they're looking bunt. And there it is. And it's overrun by Knight, picked up and thrown by Darling for the out. Knight looked back at the turf as if it had done him wrong. And he can be happy that Darling backed him up. He's charging so hard, it could have been a really a routine, easy play for him. And he, he elects to go one hand with it, and it takes a little bit of a bad bounce. Remember early we talked about it, the ground crew did a great job in getting this field ready but they really had to put a lot of topsoil extra sod on it because of what they did when they clinched it and Darling a good in, uh, a good fielder as a pitcher backing up to play and they get their man at first. If you're scoring Knight did not touch the ball it is basically a one four sacrifice and now here's Wade Boggs Henderson at second two runs in two nothing Boston. Boggs lined out to Santana in the first inning. Right. If you were just looking at the defense, you would say they're not going to give Boggs anything slow to hit. They'll show it to him. Look how far over Hernandez is. They expect him to hit from center field to the left field line. It looks like they're going to try to make him hit that sinker. 0 and 1. Amazing tribute to Marty Barrett, the kind of a series he's having. Pitching carefully to Boggs with two out and Marty Barrett on deck. One and one. Ball two. Henderson, the way the infield is, the only man who might bird dog him at all is Tim Tuffle, and he's far away. You can look at the infield dirt and you can see where Henderson is winding up. He is taking a lead of almost 45 feet before he stops. 
two and two. Mark on the runway, you could just about measure it. So two balls, two strikes, two out to Boggs, two in. This is his favorite count, and Darling's been throwing that sink to the outside part of the plate. And as a hopper by the diving Santana, Mookie's going to come up throwing, but Henderson, because of that big lead, will score easily. And it is three to nothing, Boston. With two men out, he's able to get that big lead in the scouting report. And talking to Frank Malzone and Sam Mealy, they, they're going to run on the Met outfielders. Santana tries to knock it down to keep it in the infield, but there was no way that Henderson was going to slow up. As soon as that ball gets to the outfield, the scouts told him, take off. It's still kind of amazing when you realize it. With a runner in scoring position at two out, they pitch to the major league's leading hitter. And he drives in the run. He may have widened that zone a little bit as we watch Henderson score to knock in that run. And here is Marty Barrett. That's right. Barrett flied to right in the first inning. Three nothing Boston on two home runs. A walk sacrifice. And since they pitch to Boggs, he singles it in. Up along third, it's staying on the grass, base hit. Once it, it grabbed that grass, it was going to stay there. It looked like for a minute it was going to get to the dirt part. Had it gotten there, it would have rolled foul. There's no way that would stay fair once it hits the dirt. But when it grabs that grass, now right about there, it looked like it was going to go foul. But once it hit the grass, it's almost like little fingers, like octopus grass. He just held it. And Marty Barrett, say what you want. There he goes again. He's in the middle of it for the big guys. And left hand to Sid Fernandez, loosening up. Two on, two out. And Bill Buckner becomes the eighth man to come to the plate in the second inning. Buckner singled to right in the first inning. So Darling, on four days rest, has been hit hard, plus the bunt single. Remember two of the outs in the first inning Bob's lined hard at Santana and Rice lined deep to Strawberry. One and oh. And that's going to be hit to left center but Mookie on his horse and flags it down. However, the Red Sox get three and lead two. And at the end of an inning and a half, the Red Sox three and the Mets. The importance of this play, if Strawberry had held onto the ball, the Red Sox would have scored one and not three. This ball is out of the strike zone. If Boggs hits, he really widens the zone. And watch, Mookie is in shallow, but it's what Malzone and Mealy were talking about. Run on uh, Mookie, but you can see Henderson was only about two steps past third base. So the scouting report really helped score that run. Three to nothing, Boston. Gary Carter to start it off, and he bunts down to get it as Hurst. Full turn, and the throw got him. And that's the best fastball Hurst has thrown in three games. He really reared back and pumped that one because the bunt was a good one. And with Bob's back, Mets are trailing by three. You expect Carter to really take a big cut. He catches everybody except Hurst by surprise. And does this big guy crank a fastball? Look at that. So Carter nipped at first on the bunt, one away, and Darryl Strawberry the batter. Ball one. And Finn, with that pitch, Hurst has only made 11 pitches, and he's got four outs. One ball and no strike. High fly ball into shallow left. Jim Rice has plenty of time to get there. Darrell Strawberry now old for his last 10 here, dating back to game three of the playoffs with Houston. Two down, and Ray Knight the batter. Boston three, Mets nothing in the second. Two down, bases empty. On deck, Kevin Mitchell. Nice.
Wright who scored the winning run in that somewhat bizarre game Saturday night. Strike. Bruce Hurst came into this game with a World Series ERA of one. One ball, one strike. One and one to Ray. Ball two. Ball and a one hopper into center, base hit for Knight. The Ray bangs one up the middle with two down, and Kevin Mitchell coming up. Here's the pitch that Ray Knight hits, it looked like a fastball. It was a fastball. Got a three-run lead, Hurst. He wants to stay away from the base on balls. He challenged Knight, and he lost. Kevin Mitchell with Rafael Santana on deck. Bruce Hurst is trying to win his third game of the World Series, and that doesn't happen very often. It has happened 12 times in history. But only four times since 1920. Harry Brakeen, Lou Burdett, Bob Gibson, Mickey Lolich. Dropped in there. Strike. Three runs, five hits for John McNamara's band. No runs, one hit for the Mets. Check swing and a roll a wider first to Buckner. He will do it himself. So the Mets no run to hit. They leave one. It's three nothing Boston at the end of two. We'll be back after these messages from your local station. Ahead of our time. And by New York Life to help you get the most out of your life. The Red Sox got the most out of the second inning to enjoy a three nothing lead. Jim Rice, Dwight Evans and Rich Gedman. Coming up now against Ron Darling. And the curveball is whacked to left. Going back on the ball is Mitchell, and it short hops the wall. Rice for two, the throw in, and got him. Mitchell knows the ball's over his head. He plays the carom just perfectly, and the motif of running on the outfielders. Mitchell uncorks a strong throw. And Tuffle makes the tag on Rice. Look at Wendelstadt on both knees making that call. You talk about being in position. So a base hit to left at the base of the left field wall. 7-4 of you scoring from Kevin Mitchell to Tim Tuffle. That was your classic hanging curveball. It wasn't just it hung up there. Breaking ball up. Dwight Evans the batter. And it is apparent in the early going from the moment that Wade Boggs opened the game with the line drive at Santana that it is a shaky start for Ron Darling although there is no one throwing in the bullpen. He's only had one pitch going for him so far. It's been that hard sinker and he's really had to spot it because when he got to uh, Evans he was sitting on it and boomed it. There's a breaking ball lifted to straight away shallow center. Mookie Wilson there. Two down. That'll bring up Rich Gedman. Who hit the home run in and out of Darrell Strawberry's glove in the second inning and turned it from a one run inning to a three run inning. And you might remember throughout the series we told you how Darling and Gedman battled each other in high school. And finally Gedman has hit one strike.
on deck Dave Henderson. Never seen so many players with that stubble like we got now. Hernandez didn't shave. Denman hasn't shaved. It's the Samson theory, I guess. Ground ball back at first. Keith will bring it to the bag. So thanks to the strong and accurate throw of Kevin Mitchell, the Sox are gone in order. And at the end of two and a half, three nothing Boston. Ball one. During the regular season. The Mets gave left handers a bad time but not in the World Series against Bruce Hurst. Ball two in the regular season they beat left handers 27 times and lost to them only 11 That's better than 700 ball in there doing one. So Hurst trying for his place in the history books and the Mets trying to come back. Fouled off. Two and two. See how nice he was. He asked Gedman, "Are you all right?" He got a foul tip. If that ball would have laid in front of home plate, they would have checked the ball. But the pitcher's worried about the catcher. Two and two. Fouled away. Of course, he hit a home run. That's when they're really nice yeah. to you. Three runs, six hits for Boston. No runs, one hit for the Mets. A two out single by Ray Knight. After that pitch, and down he goes. So Santana becomes strikeout number one for Bruce Hurst. Looked like a breaking ball. It was not that big overhand curveball that he throws. It could have been that fork ball. It broke down off speed. When he throws that slow, big breaking curveball. He really gets those hitters out in front. There is Ron Darling. And he drives one to right and deep. Evans was shallow. He's on the track to make the catch. And Darling, who is considered a pretty good hitting pitcher, takes Hurst a long way. Two down. Now Mookie Wilson will use up a little time to let Darling get back to the dugout. Mookie grounded out, first ball swinging. He rolled it to Marty Barrett, leading off the first inning. Anywhere to kill time. Ask the umpire how your family's doing, anything. And Buckner had made a trip to the mound. Tim Tuffle on deck. A little high with a fastball, ball one. won 115 games along the way. The Sox 102 and it has come down to tonight. Fouled off two and one. Fastball hit to right. Evans going back full turn. Makes the play. The so Mookie takes him deep, but they're gone in order. Are the Mets and at the end of three, Red Sox three, Mets nothing. It might be interesting to note the crowd perhaps has the same feeling as you have. During the regular year, the Mets won 80% of the games that they scored first in, and they're three and zero in games in which they scored first in postseason. But it's the Sox on top, three nothing, and here is Dave Henderson. He walked. And came around to score in the second inning. Then Owen and Hurst. And hit him. So Henderson trots to first with nobody out. Owen coming up. And by comparison, as far as the number of pitches as we watch Henderson get drilled, Darling has made 57 pitches. He had 55 after three innings. Hurst in three innings, 29 pitches. Mm -hmm.
So darling a shaky early going and a strong performance by Bruce Hurst and you have Owen Hurst and Boggs coming up. Sid Fernandez is up for the second time in the Mets bullpen. Although Darling did have his at bat in the third inning. Though it is Fernandez they look to in the early going and not Dwight Gooden. Spike Owen popped to short in the second inning. A little pop fly to Rafael Santana. Knight is really looking for bunt in tight at third. And instead he hits it right at Strawberry. One away Henderson holding and Bruce Hurst who sacrificed in the second inning no doubt has to do it again here in the fourth. And a third baseman Knight and first baseman Hernandez setting up the defense. As we saw the last time Knight really charged hard the ball got by him and Hernandez who as always he sets up whether he's going to come charging in or come in a couple steps and go back on a particular pitch. He'll be two, three pitches into the hitter Hurst, but Knight is already in about five steps. It's going to be a tough job for Hurst to get him over. And if Hurst does get him over, once again, Davy Johnson will have to wonder about even pitching at all to Boggs. Never mind, don't give him anything good to hit. He hit a ball off his ankles for a base hit and an RBI. There's the bunt. And Knight has to go to first. Now let's see what they do with Boggs. And it can't be that situation. It, so many times you hear when you go out on a conference on the mound is don't give him any uh, ball to hit. Davy Johnson on his way and he's making a hook right now. So Sid Fernandez is going to be called in from the Mets bullpen. And Ron Darling has had it. So they pitched to Boggs in the second inning and he burned them. He will not be burned again. And of course the runner at second base Dave Henderson is also his responsibility. Sid Fernandez will be coming in making his third appearance of the World Series. He worked four and a third innings and earned run average of two. It is a calculated gamble sending Fernandez head to head with the leadoff man Wade Boggs. Sid has an above average fastball. He is considered, however, a poor fielder. Wade Boggs against Darling lined out to short, and then when they pitched to him, even though Darling threw a ball that was somewhere between the ankles and the knees, Boggs went right down after it and singled the center for an RBI. And it's no great secret that Boggs really waits a long time before he turns that bat loose. And if you think he does that against right handed pitching it's a little bit more it seems like against left hand pitching. He usually takes him to the opposite field and they'll set the defense up accordingly. So Sid Fernandez who pitched very very well impressively in fact in relief of Dwight Gooden. That was in the Hearst game at Fenway Park. Now going head to head with Wade Boggs. Ball one. Again, we are watching Henderson. He had such a big lead in the second inning. He was almost halfway to third as the pitcher was delivering the ball, and yet he knows he can get back to the bag. You see him run right out of your picture. And once again, Mookie in center field is uh, far more shallow than Dykstra would be as we look at Henderson. Look how shallow he is in left center field. And they'll take off on the base hit. Two and oh. Fouled off two and one. Boston three Mets nothing two out top of the fourth inning. I tell you when you stack your defense like that you better pitch that he hits that way if he gives him anything slow he'll pull it to Hernandez is way over. Remember the base hit was to the left of Santana. In there. Two balls, two strikes, and two out. The way by. Henderson at second. Spun the curveball. Three and two. He made sure that thing wasn't close, though. And this time in under the hands to put him on. 
So Boggs walks, and that'll bring up Marty Barrett. And for Davey Johnson, he opted to pitch to Boggs. It cost him a run in the second. Then he made the move to take Darling out and bring in Fernandez, and he still lost Boggs on the walk. Barrett flied to right and had the bun single in the second inning. Marty is one for two. Ray Knight very deep at third. He is not looking for Barrett to do it again. Not with two on and two out. Right. They just moved Mitchell over. Mitchell was playing Barrett as if to pull, and Mookie Wilson, as you can see, the defense is way over in right center field. A lot of room in left center field. They're stacking it on the right side. They expect to hit that way. And it'll be up to Fernandez to keep that ball in that outside part of the plate. 0 and 1. Henderson can't take the lead with Barrett up there, but he was able to take with Boggs, because now Santana is almost behind him. 0 and 1. One ball, one strike. We really haven't seen a lot of bird dogging by the infielders, though. Mm -hmm. A lot of ball clubs, uh, many times, it, just bird dog the guy back, not so much to pick him off, but to cut his lead down to maybe you get a play at the plate on the base hit. One and one. Off speed for a strike. A lot of motion and then the soap bubble and the count one and two. And laid it right on the outside corner. First base, Wade Boggs, Dave Henderson at second, two out. Two and two. Red Sox left a runner in the first inning and two more in the second. Fernandez trying to get him off the hook here in the fourth. Ball hit to Strawberry. So the Sox leave two. They have left five. And at the end of three and a half innings, the Red Sox three, the Mets nothing. Started with Tim Tuffle, Keith Hernandez, and Gary Carter. They have just one hit, a single to Santa by Ray Knight, and that came with two out in the second inning. Of course, if you remember, Saturday night in that wild game, the Mets were no hitted for the first four innings. Double popped up to the right side to Marty Barrett in his first at bat. One ball, one strike. That's the first big curveball that he's thrown where he really rainbows it up there. Followed by the fastball for a strike. One and two. And another fastball, and the count remains one and two. He joined us late in the second inning. The Red Sox had back to back home runs by Dwight Evans and Rich Gedman. Gedman's ball in and out of Strawberry's glove. Henderson walked, and a two out single by Boggs made it 3 0. And a big overhand pitch takes care of him. For Hurst, his second strikeout. He's got three pitches, and he's not afraid to go to any of them. He just changed speeds on the breaking ball. He's way out in front. The one down in the fourth. Keith Hernandez, the batter, hit the ball hard, but at Dave Henderson in the first inning. On deck, Gary Carter. One ball and no strike. Now 
field about as straight away as you can play a hitter. In there at the knees, one and one. Seems like Hernandez has made up his mind to hit up the middle in uh, Saturday's game. Fly ball to center field, single to center, fly ball to center field. His first time up a line drive, he tomahawked it to the center field. It appears that when you do that, you're just hanging in there a little bit longer. One and one. And the curveball is hit to right center. Evans is digging to make the catch. The Dwight Evans has made three of the last four putouts. That was a slow curveball, and you can see Hernandez really wait for the break and then jump all over it and hit it hard, but Evans was there to make the play. Here's Gary Carter, who led off the second inning and tried to bunt his way aboard. Watch the curveball, and he just hits it very hard, but Evans, been very busy, really almost made it a routine play. Ball one to Gary Carter. And he was looking fast ball and he was a little bit out in front of it. One and one. Three nothing Boston. Fourth inning, two out, bases empty. Starting to say, man, you can almost scout Carter by watching television. Outside part of the plate. Changing speeds, just keeping it out there from the middle of the plate over. One and one. And he hits that pitch over to Marty Barrett. And so Carter is gone, the Mets are gone, and that's seven in a row retired by Bruce Hurst. We'll be right back after these messages from your local station. Did against Gedman in Boston. When they talk about climbing the ladder with a fastball, watch this. That was about letter high. Now here's the second strike. A little bit higher. Now you got him set up. Here's the third one. He just climbed it perfectly. Well, we'll see when Rich comes up. He's due to bat fourth in the inning. Just first, how Fernandez pitches him again and whether Gedman has learned anything. Bill Buckner, single to right and lined out to center. One for two. Right. Three nothing Boston. Top of the fifth inning. Buckner, Rice, and Evans. Fly ball to right field. Strawberry is there, looking up into that soup. One away. As you watch Fernandez pitch, you, you got to know that his motion is a big part of his effectiveness. It seems like he falls forward after he releases the ball, but that really isn't the case. When he pitched in the Dodger organization and briefly with the Dodgers, he curled up so much on the mound it really looked like he was throwing uphill. And the first thing Mel Stottlemyre did was. Make him stand a little more erect. Oh boy, you talk about a first ball fastball hitter being challenged. That was reduced to the fundamentals. Hit it. He had it in a pretty good spot. He struck Rice out in one inning of work of this year's All-Star game, and he has him on two. I wonder if he'll do what he did with Gedman. That was about letter high if he's going to climb that ladder with him. 0-2 oh to Jim. Got him. He just blew him away. That is the first Sox player to strike out. Jim Rice and with two down bases empty the batter is Dwight Evans. It is three nothing Boston but when you look back at that second inning if Strawberry had held on to the ball it would be one nothing Boston. Darrell unable to make the great catch. And the Sox turned it into a three run inning. Off speed for a strike. Evan home run in the second inning fly to center in the third. Spinner in there for a strike. Oh and two. 
He changed speeds on both pitches. The straight change, and then he took something off the curveball after just throwing nothing but fastballs at Jim Rice. Oh, and two. Got it. And that brings the crowd to its feet. And Ms. Smith to find out it wasn't there. Would have taken a great play, and he came as close as you can come to making it. And now he leads it off. So Fernandez has awakened the crowd by striking out Rice and Evans. We'll see now as Strawberry leads off. Right. Strawberry flied to left in the second inning. On one to Darrell. And you can see that Hurst is giving it just a little bit extra. He wants to strike out here because he knows that that'll just stop a lot of things with a strikeout. Well, too, the most successful Mets hitter against left-handers is on deck, Ray Knight. Big overhand curve miss, ball three. If you remember Saturday night, Strawberry had two big walks. High fly ball into right center, but Henderson says he has it. And he's true to his word. Long out, one away. The dimensions here 338 down the line to 358 371 and then 396 and that was the neighborhood where strawberry just hit it 410 to straightaway center. But it's a graveyard out there especially without any wind. But we saw both Evans and Gedman hit him out tonight in the second inning. Ray Knight singled for the Mets only hit. Whether it's indicative of anything, it should be pointed out. The Mets have had some long drives by Darling, Wilson, Hernandez, and now Strawberry. On ball, no strike. In there. Kevin Mitchell on deck. Hit off the end of the stick foul on the count one and two. Well, as you can see, the football giants against the Redskins, same score as we got here. Three nothing just starting the second quarter. Think Washington has any hits? I don't know. At least one. Gotta have one. One and two to Ray Knight. Fastball. Two and two. We're in the fifth. Three nothing Boston. One out. Base is empty. Hurst has retired eight in a row. Bouncer over the mound. Charging Spike Owen. Gets him. It's nine in a row and it'll bring up Mitchell. Mitchell grounded to Buckner in the second inning. Out off, four and one. Those who were there at the moment said in that wild madcap scene in the Mets dressing room following Saturday night's game. The one player who was completely calm was Kevin Mitchell. One and one. Hit 
was Kevin who scored the run on the wild pitch. Brown foul to Buddy Harrelson in the count one and two. Waiting his turn on deck, Rafael Santana. Fastball fouled off to the right, out of play. Still one and two. Hurst is really spotting the ball well, in and out, up and down. Great control of it, of the location of the pitcher. When you talk to a scout about that, they say, well, he's got good control of the strike zone. momentum build up in the top of the fifth when Rice and Evans struck out has been dampened considerably. Gedman leads off and remember we showed you our game within a game the last time Fernandez pitched against him it was high fastball started him about the letters and just kept climbing that ladder. Let's see what he does this time. And remember too that Gedman has the reputation of being a high ball hitter. Identical. Right at the letters. See if he comes back a little bit higher. No balls, one strike. Ron Darling went three and two third innings, charged with three runs, six hits. Oh and two. So far it looks like an instant replay. Consecutive strikeouts for Sid Fernandez, Jim Rice, and Dwight Evans in the fifth. Getman to open up the sixth. He didn't quite climb the ladder, but he stayed with his fastball, side on He made Getman give a little bit of tough pitch to hit, and he got the big strikeout. Here's Dave Henderson walked and hit by a pitch. Looking ahead, Sid Fernandez is due to be the second batter in the bottom of the sixth inning, but there is no one throwing in the Mets bullpen. Santana, Fernandez, and then Wilson are due up in the bottom of the sixth. One ball, no strikes. He's got to be tough to pick up. He's one of those pitchers I'm sure when they go back to the fence and say hey he's quicker than he looks that balls in on you before you know it. One and one. Hindu walked and scored in the second inning. Ball two. Fernandez, remember, was fourth in the National League in strikeouts. He was tied with Dwight Gooden. High fly ball into shallow left center. Mookie says he'll have it. Two down. Here's what Fernandez looks like with that motion. You can see him really bearing down on the target. Looks away a little bit and then. He really takes a big stride and comes down. Looks like he releases the ball and then finishes, which has to be deceptive. It's a, it's a tricky motion. He can be a remarkable pitcher. His high 14 strikeouts in the game. He has retired six in a row. A foul out of play. And Vinny's not trying to do it with trick pitches. He's just rearing back and firing. 0 and 1 to count to Spike Owen who popped to short and flied to right. Two out on the sixth. Boston three. New York nothing. One and one.
Bruce Hurst out on deck. Foul back one and two. It has to be a habit, but Carter checks everybody that comes up. I doubt his bike owner would be trying to sneak a peek. Crowd making the kind of noise it normally makes for Dwight Gooden. They want another strikeout. Off speed curveball got him looking. Pitches are. This is a fastball. He fouls it off. Fastball, low, fouls it off. Breaking ball in the same spot and strikes him out. It looked like the fastball last minute she darts in, and although he had a good cut, didn't come close to hitting him. If you wonder about the Mets in the bottom of the sixth inning, they are going for the pinch hitter. Lee Mazzilli is on deck to bat for Sid Fernandez. And Roger McDowell is in the bullpen. Strike one to Rafael Santana. Of course, it was Mazzilli who appeared as the pinch hitter in the eighth inning Saturday night and scored a run that tied up the game. One and one. Santana struck out in the third inning, and there's Roger McDowell along with Vern Hoshite. Fastball and it's hit up the middle behind the bag and here comes Spike Owen to get him. It looked like the ball was going to get through. Here it is from the center field camera. It's over the head of Hurst. And range is what makes this play on. Finishes up on the second base side and gets his man easily. Buckner again coming to the mound now with Mazzilli up there. First, by the way, is on a roll now. He has retired 11 in a row. The only time he has had to work out of his stretch was with two out in the second inning, and Ray Knight had gotten a base hit. So Sid Fernandez worked two and a third innings and he gave the ball club a big lift from the mound by striking out four and retiring seven in a row. And now Mazzilli batting for him. One and oh. Mookie Wilson on deck. Ball two. And Mazzilli by faking the bun it looked like he's going to try to push it past the pitcher at least drew Marty Baird in a couple steps at second base. Two and one to Lee. And it's hit over Buckner's head foul down the line on the count two and two. Once again, we remind our viewers we'll be selecting the NBC Miller Lite player of the game at the conclusion of this ball game. And that brings up another interesting note. Thinking that Saturday night would be the conclusion of the series. Bruce Hurst was already named the World Series most valuable player. However, the Mets pulled off the miracle because of the rain. Hurst got another chance to pitch. And now he's really working for the award, just as they're working on that right field fence. Two and two. One out, six inning, three nothing Boston. And it's hit to the hole. Base hit for Mazzilli. So Mazzilli is trying to do tonight what he did successfully Saturday night as a pinch hitter and ignite his ball club. And Mookie Wilson, the batter. Looked like a breaking ball. He was just trying to get a piece of it, and Mazzilli put it between the shortstop and third baseman, and he's on. And John McNamara knows that Hurst has only allowed two hits, so he's not showing any concern. Wilson has gone the other way twice, grounded to Barrett and flied to right. 
They are not holding Mazzilli. Buckner is back of him, and now he has to run in front. Consequently, the collision. See Buckner sneaking behind him, and Mazzilli just kind of bumps him. Not a bad play. Line drive into left field. Base hit. And the Mets are alive with one out in the six. And Tim Tuffle coming up. for the bag and evidently he's okay. Gedman and I'll be there play side arms it and Mookie just does get there. There you see the knee getting that right arm as Buckner was trying to block the base. Two balls and no strikes to Tim Tuffle. Doing one. Took something off the pitch, way out in front. Wilson at first, Mazzilli at second, one out. Hernandez on deck. from the 
stretch. expecting strength against strength and he pulled the string on that one. On one. Outfield straight away. Fastball hit into left center field. Base hit. In comes Mazzilli. In comes Wilson. Stopping at third is Tuffle. Three to two Boston. Tony Armas 
Davis missed 31 games during the year with ankle and thigh injuries. And of course, you remember he injured himself in Anaheim, and it actually helped the Red Sox win the pennant because Dave Henderson took over and performed some magic. And that got a little bit of John Kibler. Took a bite out of him, 0 oh and 1. The plate umpire, okay, but that hammered him. They really are playing arm us to pull. Knight is guarding the line, or Santana's in the hole, and Mitchell is towards the line in left field. There you see it. And we'd expect to hit that ground ball. Look at Knight. When you look at Tony Armas, two years ago he led the majors in RBIs. This year he was eighth on the Red Sox. Big chopper, foul ball. Well, they didn't think they could regroup and come up with another dandy after Saturday night, but there is Calvin Chiraldi, and we're 3 3 in the seventh inning. Armis followed by Boggs and then Barrett. Sinker got him. McDowell just rears back and throws his best pitch, which is the sinker. It starts at about the knees, tough to lay off. And when you try to chase it, it's out of the strike zone. But with two strikes, Armas was trying to get a piece of it. Where's Boggs, who lined a short, hit one about at the ankles for a line drive base hit and a run batted in. Last time up, walk. Right. Three runs, six hits for Boston. Three runs, four hits for New York. Strike. Little chopper to third. Knight waits for the hop. Guns in the dirt. Dug out. to wait for the big hop he throws it low but watch Hernandez not only is he digging out he's in front of that ball it was not going to get by him that's a short hop a tough play a classic picture if he misses it it hits him in the leg and now he says to the umpire I caught it here's Marty Barrett fly to right bunted for a hit fly to right again a chopper over the mound here comes Santana got it The end of six and a half, all even at three. There's another kind of Ford Tempo, specializing in sheer exuberance. Ford Tempo Sport GL. Its high output engine and road handling suspension tell you it wants to be driven. Ford Tempo Sport GL. Think of it as fun in a distinctively different form. Ford Tempo Sport GL. Twinkies cakes, cupcakes too. Nothing escapes the eye of maximum. The world's first SLR with built-in autofocus. In the Mets dugout, Hernandez and Carter, and we go to the bottom of the seventh. Three, three. Oh, is it wild here? <laughs> That's the way. That's the way it should be. Uh -huh. Two clubs battling down the line. It's the seventh game of the World Series, going into the seventh, eighth, and ninth innings. The nine toughest outs in baseball, and and everybody up on their feet. Calvin Chiraldi, the former Met.
coming in to try and stifle the Mets. Bottom of the seventh inning. On deck, among others, as you see, Orozco. Knight will lead off, but Mitchell is going to give way to Lenny Dykstra. So it's going to be Knight, Dykstra, and Santana. And remember, Backman is in the game, having run for Tuffle. Singled and grounded out. He is one for two. You know, we have seen Calvin Chiraldi in so many pressure packed moments in the league championship series with the Angels and in the Red Sox. You might forget his first ever major league save was in August. I mean, he's just starting. On deck, Len Dykstra. Ball two and the chant, Calvin, Calvin. Dykstra the batter for Kevin Mitchell. The first home run at home hit in this World Series by the home team. And you hear so much about concentration. Ray Knight was quoted saying he was once told that concentration is the ability to think about nothing. So he certainly was up there loose and really ripped a high fastball. Ball three and Sambito and Stanley are throwing in the Red Sox bullpen. Strike. Boy, I tell you, the last two will kill you. <laughs> Dykstra really tried to get down lower normal to try to get that base on balls. Three and one. Line drive, base hit to right field. Here's another look of Ray Knight's home run launched over the wall in left center. It looked like it was a belt high fastball. And Chiraldi, the minute it was touched off, knew it, and there's his reaction. And watch Knight coming around. And what a welcoming party he had. It is so noisy at Shea, you can't hear the airplanes. You think you're out in the country. And Bill Fisher is out to the mound. I tell you, with all this, 
and Dykstra in first base. Don't be surprised if he takes off on the very first pitch to keep it going. By the way, as Johnny McNamara looks at the lineup cards, when the Red Sox come up in the eighth inning, they will have Bill Buckner, Jim Rice, and Dwight Evans. Rafael Santana, the batter, and he'll be fouled by Roger McDowell. And Boggs looking butt on the grass. I think I'd pitch out just to stop everything, but you have to worry about Chiraldi's control. Out at the Meadowlands, Vin. They tell me when they put the score up there, the noise was so great that the players they had to stop the play. I can believe that. One ball and no strikes. Dykstra at first. The Mets are two for two with pinch hits by Mazzilli and Dykstra in the sixth and now seventh inning. A better throw might have gotten him. He was far off the bag. Oh, he wants to go. He wants to keep it going. The, the merry-go-round is on full speed, and he wants to make it go faster. Santana has not been called upon to bunt with the pitcher following very often. He has only one sacrifice. And again, Dykes were taking liberties. That's about as big a lead as the law allows. He's right about at the uh, the beginning of the straight line as far as the grass. There's, it's cut at an angle to give the first baseman more dirt, but right at the start of where it's a straight line, right about there is where he is. That's a long way out there. One ball, no strikes. Dykstra not going on a pitch out and it's a wild pitch. Dykstra to second base. Gedman gets out there but I mean he is way off the target with the uh, pitch out. It's a play you practice and there is Bruce Hurst looking on. Gedman going out to talk to his pitcher. He's going to have to settle him down because, I mean, the wheels have come off. And of course, John McNamara can think of the hit batter involving Brian Downing. The wild pitch Saturday night. The wild pitch tonight. 2 0 oh to Rafael Santana. Dykstra second and nobody out. Punched inside first and down. Santana. It's a manufactured run to the extent that Santana was going to at least get the ground ball to the right side. Chiraldi jammed him with the fastball, but trying to hit it to the right side, he gets the base hit, and of course Dykstra, looking like he was going to steal, gets the pitch out wild pitch in scoring position, and he still have it going. So it is five to three Mets, and here is McDowell a strike. Calvin Chiraldi has faced three batters. He has given up a home run and two singles, a wild pitch, and two runs. And the Mets have jumped out in front. McDowell not sure of the signs from Harrelson. Oh, and one. Bunt. Foul ball. We mentioned it earlier. With these two, you never know. Counting the league championship series and the World Series, the Mets have come from behind 44 times. That includes tonight. 44. But on the other side of the diamond, you have a ball club that won 19 times in its last at bat, including the playoffs, the Boston Red Sox. Ball one. And Boston must be thinking, remember the 10th inning. 
Saturday night. We were leading five to three. Now it's five three New York bottom of the seventh. The bunt to Buckner. No play at second. The out at first. I thought he had a play. At I thought he had a play. He looked and all of a sudden decided not to go to second base. In fact, Barrett had snuck in behind first base, so he was well protected. In fact, I thought there was a play on. And you can watch it. Now, Buckner, I think, gets it in plenty of time. He's got a play right there. Man, Santana really he still had a play after double pumping, but he took the sure out. I don't know whether. The grass was Wilson intentionally with Wally Backman the switch hitter coming up. What an awesome moment here especially if you are a visitor to hear 50,000 people in unison chanting and singing we will we will rock you and they are rocking Shea. been much of a hitter right handed. That's why he didn't start against Bruce Hurst. But he's hitting right handed against Sambito with Hernandez on deck. Santana at second Wilson at first one out five three Mets in the seventh inning. Way outside great save by Rich Gedman or you have runners at second and third. Looked like a case of just overthrowing the ball. Gedman ready for anything, and he gets out there, and makes a play like much like a first baseman. So two former Mets, first Calvin Chiraldi, now Joe Sambito on the griddle. Ball two. single took second on a wild pitch Santana singled him in McDowell sacrificed and Wilson was walked intentionally three and one to Backman on the corner he's taken all away and that's the way they play and that's the way they should with Hernandez coming up next. Santana and Wilson checking with Buddy Harrelson to see if they'll play run and hit. I would hold them. One out. And Backman asking for time. Backman, who is not effective as a right hand hitter. So if he strikes out, you'd run out of the inning and you take the bat out of Hernandez's hand, so we'll see. He's a tough man to double up. Three and two. Runners will hold. Fouled away. Five runs, seven hits for the Mets, including the home run by Ray Knight. Three runs, six hits, and no errors for the Red Sox, who had back to back home runs by Evans and Gedman back in the second inning. But since those back to back home runs in the second inning, 
The Red Sox have had just one hit after the second inning. They have stopped completely. Thanks to Sid Fernandez. He's the one that gave him that thing called momentum. Three and two. Runners hold. Ball four. It was Hernandez who was 0 for 2 when he came to the plate in the sixth inning. And with the bases loaded, single to left center to drive in two. Bob Stanley is probably getting ready to pitch to Gary Carter. Hernandez tries to hang in against that left-hander and take him to the opposite field. He was able to do that to Hurst. And now he's facing another left-hander, Sambito. Santana at third, Wilson at second, Backman at first. One out, two in, five three New York. Time. High fly ball to center. That's plenty deep. In fact, Wilson and Santana tag. Santana will score. Wilson to third, 6-3 New York. And John McNamara will now bring in Bob Stanley to pitch to Gary Carter. Three runs charged to Bruce Hurst. He does not have a decision. Three runs charged to Giraldi. He will have a decision unless the Sox can come back. It is 6-3 New York. Two out in the seventh, and we'll be back. Tamara for the moment with his head down. The Mets leading the Red Sox 6-3 in the seventh inning. And Bob Stanley will go head to head with Gary Carter. Wally Backman is at first. Mookie Wilson is at third. And of course it was Stanley who threw the wild pitch that turned Shea Stadium into the madhouse the other night. Carter tried to bunt for a hit, grounded out, picked up an RBI on a force play. Ball one. Don't forget the Red Sox will have Buckner, Rice, and Evans in the top of the eighth. 55,032 at Shea. It sounds like 100,000. Chopper to Owen to play. Got him at first. Otherwise, another run. But the Mets come up with three more. And at the end of seven, the Mets six and the Red Sox three. Of Major League Baseball. What we have now is a brief show of strength to the 55,032. The policeman on horseback, along with police in the stands, by inference telling the crowd they will not allow the exhibition that occurred here when the Mets clinched the pennant. That bullpen has been turned into a horse pen. That's where they are, and they're going to come out. What a show of strength. There they are in the bullpens. And we can only hope that if and when this crowd celebrates, they will be dissuaded from any wild acts. Because from what they tell me, when the Mets won the pennant here, it looked more like sharks at feeding time. However, the Sox have six outs left with Buckner, Rice, and Evans coming up in the eighth inning. And Roger McDowell, who is in his fifth game, five of seven, pitching to Buckner.
Bill Buckner single to right, lined out to center and flied to right, but those at bats were against Ron Darling. The Sox jumped out to a 3 0 lead, and there's a looping single to left. That's only the second hit for Boston since the second inning. So they just stopped completely, and the reason they stopped so completely was the performance by left hander Sid Fernandez in the fourth, fifth, and sixth innings. There, as you can see, the newcomers, Backman, of course, came in having run for Tuffle in the sixth inning. Dykstra taking over in center and Wilson moving over to left. Fouled away. Jim Rice trying to get his ball club back in the ball game. As we mentioned earlier Rice has only had five at bats in the entire series with a runner in scoring position. Fouled away. And he led off the inning. One out of three at bats tonight so just about a half of his at bats in the series he's been the leadoff man. And he's going to be in trouble doing that. And with McDowell pitching they don't expect him to pull the ball they're really bunching him up the middle. On deck, representing the possible tying run, Dwight Evans. Rice lined out to right, so he can take a sinker ball that way. Single to left, and then struck out against Sid Fernandez in the fifth inning. One and two. Two and two. It happened in threes tonight. The Red Sox got three in the second inning. The Mets got three in the sixth. The Mets got three in the seventh. And Washington got three in the half. <laughs> two and two. Line drive gets on by as it explodes. And McDowell now is in trouble. A low ball pitcher against a low ball hitter who represents the tying run, Dwight Evans, and nobody out. He got that pitch up to Rice. They had him played pretty well. The defense was there, but he hit it so hard he just got right on by. And you can see the ball is up. A sinker ball, he can't pitch there. And Santana, even at that, almost came up with it. And now it is strength against strength. In the Mets bullpen for the second time, left-hander Jesse Orozco begins to loosen up. Evans homered in the second, fly to center and struck out. Buckner at second, Rice at first, nobody out. Ball one. On deck is the left hand hitting Rich Gedman. And Orozco in the wings. That's right. One and one. Davey Johnson made a pinch running move uh, when he put Backman in. You wonder if McNamara is thinking about Buckner at second base at least pick up that run. It's going to be tough for our Buckner to score on a single. There's no speed at all out there with Buckner and Rice. And that's going to be hit into right center field. That's a base hit. And even Buckner on one leg will score easily. And let's watch Rice. They're going to wave him in. Backman has no play and the Sox have come back with two and the Mets lead is now six five and the tying run is at second base with nobody out. Evans really plugged the gap in right center field. Dykes from center field shedding him a bit towards left center a lot of room and watch Buckner he sees it fall 
And here he comes. It rolls all the way to the fence, and Buckner able to score, as did Rice. Easily. And when you can score Buckner and Rice without a play, and Backman had no play whatsoever, you know that ball was hit deep in the right center, and that's going to be all. Rice back at second. The bench was hollering at Ray Knight, and he's come up. He's about even with the bag at third now. So the tying run is at second base, nobody out, and Orozco going head to head with Rich Gedman. Six five Mets, eighth inning. Gedman all year had one sacrifice. Orozco's not sure of the signs at all. And I tell you, in a spot like this, you'd almost say, hey, one's a fastball, two's a curve, no trick plays with uh, Evans on at second base. And you, you know what I think? What? I think maybe Dave. Davy Johnson wanted to find out about instructing Orozco on a bunt situation, and yet would that constitute a trip to the mound? That could be what they were talking about. Now they're going to appeal a run missing at third. No, says Joe Brinkman. But why would he talk to Kibler and Wendelstead? And why would they wait 30 minutes to do it? Okay, it's six five Mets, tying run at second, nobody out. Gedman followed by Henderson. And then Owen. Big sweeping curveball. On one. Of course, if you get that slow curve, that's about the best pitch you can handle to get a bunt, but I don't think McNamara is thinking bunt. Well, Roscoe is thinking one thing, he's got to go for the strikeout. On one. And that was violated the other night. But at home, you bunt to win on the road. Well, Gedman hacking away 0 and 2. 4 1. What you just said was according to the book. Right, but and the book is gone. That's right. The other night, first and second, Johnson decided not to bunt because Howard Johnson didn't look good on the first attempt. So that book, forget it, it's been burned. One and two to Rich Gedman. And he's going to hit a line drive at Backman over to Santana. Not in time. Boy, was that close. And I'll tell you one thing Santana had a little heat to handle on the dead run. Backman fired it. Good play by Santana. And good play by Backman and a great play by Dwight Evans. You can see he started to lean and Backman, he really guns it over there. Santana very alertly there, but Evans. A good piece of base running. So Gedman line drive at Backman, one out, and of course that's a very expensive out late in the game. If he makes an out, if that ball hits the ground first and he's able to move his man to third, you'd have the tying run 90 feet away. If you're wondering about Don Baylor, he is on the steps of the Red Sox dugout. The steps. There he is. So one out. Evans at second. Six five Mets in the eighth inning. Now back. Henderson walked, was hit by a pitch, and flied to center. And the way they're defensing Henderson, Evans at second base would be able to get a pretty good sized lead because he'll be able to watch the second baseman Backman. You can see they're playing him the pull. Knight will guard the line. And Santana near the hole, and you can see where Backman is, so Evans can keep an eye on him and get a pretty good lead. Single by Buckner, single by Rice, and a double by Evans to get the Sox back in the game. Mets lead 6-5. Blocked nicely by Carter, and Evans has to hold it second. 
Once again, Carter keeps that ball in front of him, and there's nothing Evans can do. And when you see that ball in front of you, the first rule is don't go anywhere. You'll watch it here. Henderson getting a lot of curveballs. Remember, he took Aguilera deep for the home run in the 10th inning Saturday night. One and two. Throwing the curveball, there was no way Henderson was going to see a fastball. The target was the back, the right kneecap, and Carter making the save on that one that bounced there was a big play at that time at bat because Orozco comes back with the strike. And now they're having a big meeting on the mound as to what they're going to do with Baylor. Baylor has had 10 at bats in the series. He has two hits. One of the two hits a double. And one run batted in. So the man who became the designated sitter in the National League now comes up trying to get the Sox even. And the key, of course, Gedman's line drive at Backman. Time run, Dwight Evans at second base. Henderson stay away from the fastball show him the fastball make him hit the breaking ball and Orozco's best pitch is a slider but he started him with the slow breaking ball ground ball to the hole that's where Santana was playing him got him Mets, and this is the epitome, the pinnacle of all baseball to get the final game of a seven game World Series, a one run game, and the home club coming back to take the lead, and the visiting team really making a run. And both clubs really battling so far. The difference has been the Santana ground ball, which went for the base hit. <laughs> In the bottom of the eighth inning, two changes for the Red Sox. Al Nipper is on the mound, and Ed Romero. If you're keeping score, put Nipper in the number eight spot, occupied by Owen. And put Romero number nine, so he's due to lead off in the ninth inning. The Sox got three in the second inning, but maybe the turning point, certainly emotionally, was the job that Sid Fernandez did to stop the Sox, inspire the crowd, which in turn seemed to inspire the hitters. And here's Strawberry, fouled away. And he had to do it twice, Vin. If you remember in that fifth inning when he ended by striking out uh, Rice and Evans, the crowd was really up, and then Hurst came back, and he shut the uh, Mets down, and... Fernandez came back and did it again in the sixth. Brown foul to Bill Robinson, 0 and 2. It's been Bruce Hurst, Calvin Chiraldi, who is the pitcher of record, Joe Sambito, Bob Stanley, and Al Nipper. The Mets have used Ron Darling, Sid Fernandez, Roger McDowell, and Jesse Orozco. And one of the big questions will be whatever happened to Oil Can Boy?
Knight who singled a center, grounded a short, and homered in the seventh inning. 7-5 Seven, New York. And if you are young Darrell Strawberry, you must sit in the dugout and think, take your dad. Slow it up. Knight will be followed by Lenny Dykstra. Here's another look at that skyrocket, a towering drive that went out at about the 370 sign, and he knew it immediately. It'll take him about 20 minutes to go around the base pad. Oh, he really took his time. It was one of those majestic home runs, a towering drive, and he was going to enjoy it as much as anybody. That's the look in game five when the whole right field stands. Down Took him a while, but he answered them tonight. Up the middle, base hit for Ray Knight. In the Red Sox dugout, as Renee Latchman charts every pit to look ahead for Boston. They will have Ed Romero, Wade Boggs, and Marty Barrett. And the Mets hitters are trying to lighten the load for Jesse Orozco. Here's Dykstra. Dykstra batted for Mitchell in the seventh inning and singled a right. That's when the Mets broke the three three time one and all look like a knuckleball the Mets won 115 games up to here the Sox had won 102 and the payoff is tonight with three outs to go Right. One and one. Santana on deck. Two balls, one strike. One twice, went six innings and had his team even when he came out. He is not involved with the decision, but he's the youngster who was voted the MVP, and of course he'll lose that award. Hit up the middle, but in motion is the shortstop Romero who is breaking the cover, and by being in motion, he takes a hit away from Dykstra. Knight into second base. Looks like it's going to get through there, but Romero was breaking to cover second base and was in perfect position and really turns it into a routine play. Rafael Santana, who had a key hit in the seventh inning when he singled inside first base to drive in Dykstra. One for three. And it was a good pitch that Giraldi made to Santana, who was trying to hit the ground ball and be sure he picked up the base uh, if he did make the out, but he jammed him. Santana swung and got it between Buckner in the bag and drove in a big run. Santana struck out, grounded out, and then single. They are going to walk him intentionally with Orozco coming up. And Orozco might very well be asked to bunt, and Mookie Wilson would then come up. Used the punt as a defensive play to the point to stay away from the double play, which would end the inning. Again, while we have the moment, 
the Red Sox are due to send up in the ninth inning Ed Romero Wade Boggs and Marty Barrett and remember the Red Sox won 19 games including the playoffs in their last at bat so like the Mets they show and have shown remarkable resiliency. Orozco has only had three at bats all year and he does not have a sacrifice and a meeting at the mound. I'd almost bet the house that he's going to bunt oh, off. Yes. And I'm pretty sure that's what they're talking about. Lay the ball in there and maybe we can make a play at third. So Al Nipper, he was the man who was sent to the mound in John McNamara's calculated gamble. And the Mets eventually won the game six to two. Nipper went six innings and allowed three runs in that game. And now Nipper, in the eighth inning of the seventh game, somehow trying to restrain the Mets from opening up a 7 5 lead. He's bunting. Ball one. What they do is, as you can see, they're really squeezing the plate. Ed Romero is breaking to cover the bag at third. That allows Boggs and Buckner to come full tilt towards the plate. Orozco is not sure. He doesn't get up that much. Harrelson's going to make sure, but again, he's got to bunt. He has to bunt to keep the inning alive. Coming. Strike. And that time Romero and they were setting it up. Romero, instead of racing for third, circled back to second. One and one. Ray Knight at second. Rafael Santana at first. of course with Boggs charging the plate Romero breaking to third there just wasn't anybody there capable of handling a ground ball and Orozco does it perfectly he just puts the bat on the ball and everybody's moving the closest man was Marty Barrett and you've got to take your hat off to Davy Johnson once, once again he walks that and on the other side a very bitter moment for all of the Red Sox. It is eight to five, New York. Now I saw a line by Louis Grizzard that really captures that picture. He said, "Losing hurts worse than winning feels good." Well, boy, it sure hurts worse in the Boston dugout. Listen to this crowd and that chant. Al Nipper with his face buried in the cloth. The dramatic shot and reminding you of Calvin Schiraldi's sad moment in Anaheim. If you're wondering, Jesse Orozco has been in the big leagues five and a half years. He had ten hits. High slicing foul. Off third, down the line, back into the crowd, out of play. So in the inning, Strawberry homered, Knight singled, Dykstra grounding out, advancing Knight. Santana walked intentionally. Orozco singles in Knight. And Mookie Wilson against Steve Crawford. Ten hits in five years. Why not let him swing? <laughs> With that kind of managerial strategy, Johnson ought to be buying lottery tickets after the game. 0 <laughs> 1. 
hit him. He, yep, he goes to first. And that will load the bases. Mookie's quick, but that one nailed him. It was Mookie, you remember, at the plate on the wild pitch. Saturday night. Here's Saturday night. The pitch that didn't hit him, thrown by Stanley, that went to the backstop. So the Mets have loaded the bases. The infield has to play up. The Mets leading 8-5. Ground ball and a broken bat. Barrett to the plate for the force to Gedman. And Santana is erased and everybody moves up 90 feet. So Backman is at first. Wilson is at second. Orozco has reached third. And Santana out. Watch how sure Marty Barrett makes the play. He looks, finds his man, and throws a strike. Two out. They're picking up the pieces of that shattered bat. And here's Keith Hernandez. Now Nipper remains motionless in his grief in the Boston dugout. For Hernandez, it's his third at bat with the bases loaded tonight. He's single to drive in two in the sixth. His scoring fly ball picked up a run in the seventh. And here he is with a full plate in the eighth. One ball and no strikes. Eight five New York bottom of the eighth. Strike. Joe Brinkman the third base umpire but John Kibler had already called it a strike anyway one and one. The sixth Boston pitcher. Giraldi is still a pitcher of record. And there's one hit and short hop by Barrett. Keeps it in front of him and throws to Buckner. And the inning is over, but the Mets get two more. And at the end of eight, as the champagne gets colder, the Mets eight, Red Sox five, and they're three out from pulling the court. Left field for the last out, and the Mets are the world's champion. What made it interesting, the batter who made that last out is right there. The manager of the Mets, Davey Johnson. He was also the last player to get a base hit off Sandy Colfax in the 1966 World Series. But now let's see if the Sox have anything left. They rallied gamely in the eighth when they were down by three. They had two singles and a double to get within one, and they left the tying run at second. Now in the ninth, Ed Romero, Wade Boggs, and Marty Barrett against Jesse Orozco. The way the pattern of the game has developed, truly the guys who got the Mets here are out there at every position. With Hernandez and Backman and Santana and Knight and Wilson and Dykstra and Strawberry and Carter. One and one. Popped it up. It will be home. Carter or Hernandez, Hernandez. Tonight's game is brought to you by AT&T, the right choice. By the American Express card. Don't leave home without it. By Kentucky Fried Chicken, we do chicken right. And by Miller Genuine Draft, cold filtered for real draft smoothness. It's beer at its best. And the Sox who are a strike from elimination in Southern California, who look like they had a lock at game six, are now down to their last two outs. 
And here's Wade Boggs. One for three. When this game ends, we will visit both clubhouses and we will have tributes to each team, as well we should, as each team merits a tribute. And we had said, as we look at Dave Henderson and a somewhat heartbroken Red Sox bench, that it was the best of times and the worst of times. That was the tale of two cities, and that's the way the series would end. Fouled away, one and two. Ron Darling with his arm draped over Sid Fernandez, and Fernandez has to be the unsung hero. No question about it. He's the one that gave him the momentum. One and two to Wade Bonds. Check swing foul into the stands. And Jim Rice, who was frustrated in 75 because he couldn't play. Two for four tonight. One of his two outs, a line drive out to right. And he is frustrated tonight. Curveball, big chopper to Backman. Hurry to Hernandez. The executive producer of NBC Sports, Michael Weissman. The coordinating producer for NBC Baseball and tonight's director, Harry Coyle. The telecast of tonight's World Series, produced by George Finkel. Pre-game produced by Les Dennis. Pre-game directed by Andy Rosenberg. Technical directors Lenny Stucker, Stephen Semino, and Ken Harvey. And there is a smoke bomb on the field. And timeout. in the ninth inning and this crowd of 55,032 bursting their buttons to make some noise but hopefully that will be all standing in the way is Marty Barrett and Mookie Wilson out in the midst of all that smoke no timeout. An oil can boy who was supposed to pitch game seven and then the rains came. And Wade Boggs, the major league's leading hitter, can just sit and think of what might have been. Still not really ready, and there is no breeze to help, but it is dissipating. Bill Buckner is on deck, but it will be up to Marty Barrett to keep the Sox very faint hopes alive. Barrett, two fly balls to right, a bunch single, and grounded out. Away. 
This crowd will tell us what's happening. French tonight's NBC Miller Lite player of the game we feel is left hander Sid Fernandez. Miller Lite is happy to present a check for $1,000 in the name of Sid Fernandez to the National Multiple Sclerosis Society. Two and a third hitless innings with four strikeouts. Series locker room is brought to you by Ford Division, who congratulates the 1986 World Champion New York Mets on an exciting World Series, and of course, our thanks as well to the Boston Red Sox. Sock bench, Commissioner Uberoff, the manager of the ball club, Davey Johnson, the general manager, Frank Cashin, and for the presentation of the trophy, Commissioner Uberoff. Very quickly, I'm uh, pleased to tell you that there's a wire from the President of the United States congratulating the Mets. He's watched all the games. He's very happy to congratulate you, and he's invited the entire team, everyone from the organization, to the White House. Well, that's very nice, and we certainly will go, and we appreciate that. Let me tell you, it's very special, very special for baseball, and I'd like to present you right now, and this, and this great big guy, if I can, his trophy. Yeah, where's Freddie Wilpont? Fred Wilpont was going to be... Looking for Fred Wilpon, one of the owners of the ball club. Davey, you've taken your stronger than me. Davey, it's a heavy one. Great. I think 
Okay, hold it. Seven games, you did it all the way. Congratulations. It doesn't get any better than this, Peter. No, this is what it's all about. Frank, we'll start with you. You were the architect of bringing this ball club along in a few years' time from a last place team to a team that won 108 during the regular season and now reigns as world champions. Your thoughts? Well, my thoughts are that we had great ownership. Mr. Wilpont, Mr. Doubleday give us the time to really rebuild this ball club and people like Al Harrison and Joe McElvain and Steve Shriver and Harry Miner, plus Davey and some great ball players, we were able to do it. So we'll always be appreciative of the ownership and uh, it's great to be a winner as you know and I thank the fans in New York and the people everywhere that supported us. Let's get a word here from Davey. Strange and unfair as it might seem if one thing or another broke a different way Saturday night you come up short and some people unfair as it would have been would have said failure. Well that's what this game's all about. You can never take anything for granted. Strange things happen. You just keep plugging away and it happened for us. We deserve it. We, we had the best record in baseball. We should be the world champs. Your thoughts about the Boston Red Sox? They're a great ball club. It, it, you know, it was very touch and go, both, you know, break here, break there, and they could have been world champs. But the good guys got it. Is there any way to describe the roller coaster? Two out, bottom of the tenth Saturday, and you're standing here now? Well, that's baseball. That's what makes it so beautiful. You know, it's never over till it's over. I think somebody said that. And uh, this is what it's all about. This is what it's all worth sweating for. Davey, congratulations. Thank you, Bobby. A quick word from Fred Wilpon, one of the owners of the ball club. Bob, I'm very thrilled. I'm thrilled for New York. I'm thrilled for the New York Mets. Boston Red Sox have nothing to be ashamed of. They played great baseball, great character on both sides. Frank Cashin and his organization here is, I think, the best of baseball, and I love him. I love him for New York. We're going to try and get Ray Knight up here. Before we speak with Ray Knight, the most valuable player, we're going to go to the other side, to the Boston Clubhouse and Marv Albert. Marv? All right, Bob, and uh, this man to my right, Bruce Hurst of the Red Sox, who had a splendid World Series, winning two games, not able to do it tonight. But on Saturday night, at one point, you were actually voted most valuable player of the series before uh, the game was over. I know this has to be a difficult moment for you. Well, uh, you know, it's... <coughs> I'd rather trade all that stuff for the world champion. We battled hard all year long, and uh, we came back, and um, today we, we tried, but we just didn't have enough, and you have to tip your hat to the Mets. Um, they came back, we beat them the first two, and uh, they showed a lot of class and a lot of guts, and uh, they have a lot of great players on their team, and you just have to give them credit. Bruce, of course, this is 1986, uh, but ball players are very superstitious, and you look back to the Red Sox of 67, of 46, of 75, and people say they are snake bitten. What is your reaction to that? Did that have any effect on this ball club? None whatsoever. Uh, what happened in the past doesn't have any bearing on what happened today. Uh, we had every opportunity to win. Uh, we had a chance to win on game six, and we didn't put it away. And uh, we were in the game today, and then we just let it slip away. Uh, what happened in 46 and 75 and all those other years, it doesn't make any difference. It's a totally different ball club, different players, whole different cast of characters, and uh, this team can win, and we'll be back. All right, I'm working told that Ray Knight won Most Valuable Player Award uh, in the series and the last two games. Uh, he's the man who did most of the damage. He's a very good player. I felt like all along for me to win. Uh, he was one of the guys that I had to get out. He's a great, great hitter. He's a great two-strike hitter. He doesn't strike out a lot, and uh, he's an outstanding player, and I have to tip my hat to Ray. He, he did a great job for them and, and beat us. All right, Bruce, thank you very much, and Ray Knight, the series EP, is alongside Bob Costas. Let's get back to the Met locker room. Marv, thank you. And just a moment ago, Ray, Davey Johnson was saying, it's just baseball. It's the way it is. You can go from goat to hero, from the bottom to the top. And it happened for you, certainly, in such graphic fashion. It surely did, man. I, I tell you, I was so down the other night after the era, but this is a game of redeeming features. And thank the good Lord, uh, I had a chance to come back, and we won that ball game tonight. Just goes to shooting in there, things can happen. And that's the way it's been for me all year. And just a great bunch of guys. And golly, I, I don't really know what to say. I'm so excited and happy. And, and this is unbelievable. The home run that snapped the tie. Well, it was a fastball 2-1. and one. I was looking for a fastball tie ball game, and um, I'm a fastball hitter, and I just looked, uh, pitched uh, and kind of in the strike zone. He threw it right there, and I had a good swing at it. I don't hit too many of them, but I knew that was gone if he was up enough. <laughs> What did they say to you? Can you remember it all when you hit home plate and then the dugout? Boy, the last two nights, I've, everything's been pretty numb for me. My concentration level's been so high. Uh, they just hugged me and gave me high fives and all that, and I don't really know what they said. I was just uh, emotionally spent again. I, I've been exhausted the whole last couple of nights. Ball! 
guy. Let's go. Woo and uh, just uh, just the feeling of when they touch your hand and all that stuff is such a um, feeling of uh, a togetherness and closeness. I, they really said a lot, but I don't remember what they said. Congratulations on being named MVP. Thank you very much. Unbelievable. Let's get, let's get Keith Hernandez in here. You deserve it. Keith, I, I was thinking as you came to bat in the sixth <laughs> inning with the score 3-0 and the bases loaded in 82 in the other World Series in which you played for the Cardinals, bottom of the sixth at Bush Stadium, trailing 3-1 bases loaded, left-handed pitcher on the mound. An almost unbelievably identical situation, and you also got a base hit there. Well, I remember that well. I tied the game, and it was two outs at the time. Uh, I felt Bob. I swung the bat great the whole series. And everybody was saying, well, you're not hitting the ball. And I said, well, you can't look at the box scores. I've been hitting the ball good the whole series and right at people. And I woke up this morning, I told my brother who was with me from California, Gary, I said, if I get a chance with men on base today, I'm going to be the man. And it just worked out great that way. I was, uh, at a bat, I was so confident and relaxed. I was just up for that at bat. It was a, you know, it's a situation you, you thrive on, but I didn't have any butterflies. I was real, having my great concentration. On Saturday night, after you made the second out and you're down by two runs in the bottom of the 10th, you went into Davey Johnson's office and tell us what happened then. Well, I went into Davey's office. I figured it was the last at bat of my season and uh, our season. <laughs> and I, I grabbed, a, grabbed a Budweiser. Augie Bush will love that. And drank a drink of Bud and sat in Davey's director's chair. And we got two hits and then the third hit and got a run in and all of a sudden the tying runs on base. I ran in my locker and got my glove. And then I said, I was going halfway out the door going to the field, and I said, no, that chair's got hits in it, and I stayed right there. And that was a remarkable comeback. Congratulations for being part of a world champion. I promised my, my three daughters I would say hello, Jesse, Melissa, Woo! and Mary Elise, you, and my sister-in-law, Mary Horn. They're behind us all the way, and I love them. I'll see them in a week. As that and from the champagne shampoo, we go back upstairs to Vin Scully. And meanwhile, down on the mound with Kevin Elster on his feet and other members of the Mets, it has evidently been a ritual when the Mets clinched the division, clinched the pennant, why they sat on the mound, several of them. And tonight, there are those who remembered Rick Aguilera. And then, of course, we can see Howard Johnson and Kevin Elster is there. And there is Ron Darling. And they walked out with large bottles of champagne. And of course, it's not for drinking. I think they spill much more than they ever thought of drinking. And now the crowd salutes them as they can say, truly, we are number one. Let's go back now to an outstanding young player in the series, Marty Barrett and Demarv Albert. Thank you, Vin, and Marty Barrett personally had a, a sensational series, but Marty, as you take a look at what is taking place in the Met locker room and uh, down on the field, as we just saw, what goes through your mind? Well, I, I know right how they're feeling. You know, we were there when we, uh, when we came back on the Angels the same way they came back on us uh, Saturday, and we came back and won it, and uh, what can I say? They got the hits when they had to. Uh, tonight, they were down 3 nothing. They didn't give up, and uh, they're a great ball club, and it's just a, a great finish to a great year for them. Red Sox, one strike away from winning it all Saturday night. How much does that hurt? Well, it hurts. It hurts a lot, and I'm sure two weeks from now we're really going to uh, be hurting and really think about how unbelievable that was. But, uh, you know, it's funny. What goes around comes around, and I just didn't think it'd come around this quick. But uh, we did the same thing against the Angels, but, uh, you know, what can we say? If you fellows could do one thing differently, if you could do it over, what would that be? Probably get that last out Saturday night. I don't know. We played awful good ball. We played, you know, we were supposed to, people thought we were going to lose this in four or five games. Uh, they picked us fifth at the start of the season. We got a great ball club, and uh, we can all go back back home for two weeks and relax, and then we got to start hitting the weights and uh, start working out and go hard for next year. Okay, Marty, congratulations on a superb World Series. Thanks, Marv. All right, Marty Barrett of the Red Sox, and for these 1986 Boston Red Sox, it was a season of many memories, but the memories fell short. safely packed and my dreams are neatly folded away I've got nothing to show that I came very close 
To a love that might have worked out okay All the tables and chairs They stand empty and bare And there isn't any sign you were here So just walk to the door And try not to get too near You might look in my eyes And see all the pain Sadness deep inside the eyes Hey, John. Hey, Bruce. Hey, Calvin. Hey, Boston. Hold your head up. You gave it your best shot and came up a buck short. We'll be right back. Thank you, Gary Carter. Thank you, Jim Rice. Thank you, Keith Hernandez. Thank you, Roger Clemens. Thank you, Dwight Gooden. Thank you, Boston Red Sox. Thank you, New York Mets. And thank you for watching NBC Sports this year. Back in the Med Clubhouse, and we're joined by Daryl Strawberry. Daryl, it had not been a good series for you, but then you touched one off in the eighth. Well, yeah, Bobby, it had really not been a good series for me. Things have been going real tough on me. I was struggling during the whole series, but it was an important bat in that um, situation in the bottom of the eighth that we needed a big run to give us a lift and give Jesse a comfortable lead, and I was just very thankful that I got a good swing on the um, slider in. It was, the ball was down and in right where I like it, and I got a good swing, and I got a chance to get the, my, the extensions on my, that I wanted to get, and I felt good getting the hold away. What about the Gedman homer early in the game that was in and out of your glove? Well, I was kind of disappointed that I didn't catch that ball. The ball, uh, I felt that I had a good chance of catching the ball, and I got back to the wall just enough to jump. But as soon as I hit the wall, the ball went right out of my glove. And it's just one of those things that happened. But I'm just glad that everything turned out well, and we were all chaps now. And I want to say hello to my mom and sisters and brothers, and my father's back at Southern Cal that was watching the game. I love them all. I assume you and Davey Johnson are back on speaking terms now. Well, I think, we, uh, you know, it's just a, a matter of me calming down. I was kind of disappointed that he took me out of a, a big game like that World Series, and nobody wants to get taken out of a game like that when you've been around all year and, and contributing to the ball club and it's just something that happened and it's overlooked now we're world champs now and i'm very pleased daryl thank you let's turn to gary carter gary on saturday you were the last guy two outs nobody on base you got it started well i'll tell you bob the, the, that's the way this ball club played all season we just never died we we've had the kind of character that has led us to this championship and uh i just want to i just want to thank jesus christ for this because i tell you you know uh, I've dreamed of this. I've, I've dreamed of playing in this World Series, and it's finally happened. And, and the, these guys, uh, we are down 2 nothing. We did the inevitable. We went into Boston, won two out of three there. We came uh, back home, and we won the two here. And, Bob, it's the greatest feeling in the world. These guys just never stopped, and I'm just so happy that I was able to help uh, contribute. The point about toughness and character is well taken because you made a shambles of the Eastern Division race, and everybody said they haven't been tested. They, they need a crucible to prove themselves, and you did against the Astros and Red Sox. Well, there's no question. And I, I, I give a lot of credit to that Astro ball club. They were very, very tough against us. And then uh, this Boston ball club, uh, both of them are champions as far as I'm concerned. And I guess once you get to the playoffs and you've won your division, uh, you've you got to be considered champions. And uh, we're just so thankful that we're involved in this uh, playoff situation. And, uh, Bob, uh, the, the dream has come true. I know there's exhilaration here, but is there any moment when you look into the eyes of the guys wearing the other uniforms and empathize as hard as they fought and as close as they came? Well, there's got to be some empathy to a losing team. I mean, I've been on the losing end a lot of times, 
but uh, you know when I saw the excitement that they had uh, standing on top of the steps when we had those two outs in, in yesterday's ball game and we were able to come back and win it I could see the the drawn faces but more importantly we, we just never died as, as well um, I, I give them a lot of credit and all but it just wasn't meant to be for us Bob I'm, I'm just so thankful congratulations thank Garrett. you very much okay a moment ago, we paid tribute to the Boston Red Sox and their gallant fight. Now it's time to pay tribute to the world champions for 1986, the New York Mets. I can see the glow of a distant sun. And so it turned out to be the best of times for New York and the worst of times for Boston. And maybe Keith Hernandez said it so well at the very start when he said, it's a shame that somebody has to lose. It is. Uh, it's a game of emotions. We felt the Red Sox. We felt the Mets. But when you look back, it's been a great baseball season, Vin. And you have to think about the Houston Astros. You have to think about Gene Mock, the California Angels. And now everybody's making plans for next year. And that's the way it has to be. And, of course, for the New York Mets, it took 116 victories for Keith and Wally and Gary and Darrell and the rest of the world champions to be the tops, not only of the National League, but in the world championship of 1980. We'll be right back and capture more in a moment.
say Mitzi. Mitzi, not Papa, not Mama. Mitzi, Mitzi, Mitzi. So that's what they are. They're now singing the kids, Mitzi, Mitzi, Mitzi. See, when they want food and everything. So the babies are even started. We got them from four years on. We got them from 10 years on, 15 years on, 18 years on. And we got them in a group. They have their own groups that come out here. It'd be just like you're giving a banquet at our ball games. Each group comes out with their own group. And it's been spelled down, and of course, we've drawn over a million people who could do that. Oh, and God rest his soul, how Casey Stengel would have loved it. A reminder, stay tuned following local news for the Tonight Show, starring Johnny Carson and Late Night with David Letterman. Except on the West Coast, most mountain time zone stations where it will be secular time. It's heartbreak time in one dugout, Joe, and laughter and kicks in the up. Been on both sides. Losing hurts worse than feel, winning feels good. One thing about the series, they thought there wouldn't be any drama, that it was all left in the league championship series, and maybe it was slow getting underway, but what a whale of the last two games. Somehow baseball always manages to come up with that great sixth and seventh game. And somehow the youngsters, like all Ken Boyd, will learn to persevere and bounce back. And Gary Carter and his team now having climbed. And uh, I certainly was persistent. Davey gave me a chance to play. And, and uh, they say you sometimes can't turn around. But a guy wrote me a letter and says you measure a man for how far, uh, not how far he falls, but how far he bounces back. And I think we bounced pretty so far. Pretty far indeed. Congratulations to both.